Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. This is part two of the brain and we will take a brief look at the two functional brain systems. We will that, then follow that up by discussing the different ways in which the brain is protected. There are two so-called functional brain systems that are these rather extensive networks of neurons that all work together but that spread throughout several parts of the brain. And these two functional brain systems are called the limbic system, which you've heard being mentioned quite a bit of already in your earlier slides, often referred to as our emotional brain. And then there is the reticular formation system. So let's get started with the limbic system. It is primarily found in the forebrain. And remember the forebrain or the prosencephalon is, is going to include your cerebral hemispheres and also the diencephalon. If we look more specifically at what components belong to the limbic system, components that are part of the diencephalon, we see that definitely the salamus and the hypothalamus uh, make up part of the limbic system with the mammillary bodies. Remember, those are those nuclei that protrude from the inferior portion of the hypothalamus. Uh, they belong to the limbic system. And if we then take a look at those parts of the cerebrum, then we find that both the, amygdala, the, the amygdaloid body or the amygdala and the hippocampus nuclei um, are definitely part of the limbic system. There is a gyrus called the parahippocampus gyrus that sits nearby the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is a seahorse-shaped structure. You see it here in the purple. And so here is that parahippocampus um, or hippocampal gyrus. And then there is um, another gyrus called the cingulate gyrus that you see here in the green that sits sort of um, superior to the shape of the corpus callosum. As I mentioned earlier, the limbic system is often referred to as the emotional brain. It's that part of our brain in which emotions are processed and evoked. And you may have realized that very often strong emotions lead to memory and even learning. So learning and memory are a big part of the limbic system. The other important function of the limbic system is motivation. And that's where we see how there are uh, parts of the limbic system that are associated with um, the high we enjoy from uh, recreational drugs um, and the sexual arousal that might arise from abusing recreational drugs. This particular part, you may have heard of this, is called the nucleus accumbens, or the brain's pleasure center. What we also see is that the limbic system components are tightly connected to the prefrontal cortex. Remember, the prefrontal cortex is that part of our uh, forebrain uh, which functions, functions as the executor of the, the brain uh, where our planning and judging and reasoning uh, occur. And so what we find is that this interaction between the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex allows us to sometimes use logic to override our emotions. Now, in teenagers, we find that that prefrontal cortex, remember, is not quite finished de developing yet. And so there, we find that their limbic system often still predominates and the, the logical thinking or the wiser thinking cannot always um, over, override the emotions that they feel and they, they respond by, um, with the help of their emotions only. Um, we also see that because of this connection between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system, we can really gain a lot of pleasure from solving problems and um, we become consciously aware uh, 
of emotions that are occurring in our life. Remember that the, the prefrontal cortex is where we definitely become consciously aware of things while the limbic system is the emotional brain. The final thing to mention is that we, we also form emotional responses to odors with the help of the limbic system. For instance, we all associate um, the, the bad smell of a skunk as, oh, get away from that, um, <clears throat> that's, that's dangerous. Well, maybe not dangerous, but we certainly don't want to be sprayed by a skunk because of how it smells. Um, my example would often be that when I smell lilacs, I will always remember my grandmother who had lots and lots of lilacs in her backyard. So I always, um, whenever I smell lilacs, it evokes that memory of my grandmother. Our second functional brain system is called the reticular formation system. And unlike the limbic system, which is located in the forebrain, the reticular formation system is primarily located in the midbrain and the brain stem. That's not to say, though, that the reticular formation in um, the midbrain and the brainstem does not send out all kinds of neural connections to the diencephalon, the cerebellum, and even the spinal cord. It contains a, something we refer to as RAS, which, which stands for a reticular activating system. And so let's take a closer look at that. The reticular formation system, and especially its so-called reticular activating system, has four major functions, and we see two of them listed here. Sleep and consciousness, let's get started with that. What we find is that this is the part of the brain that keeps our whole brain alert and um, focused and and. Uh, attentive. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the reticular formation system is sending signals not just throughout the diencephalon but all the way to the cerebral cortex so that we can become more consciously aware of the sensory signals around us. It's also what keeps us um, awake and alert and allows us to study better sometimes, you may have noticed, in a noisy environment. Sometimes you opt to go, let's say, study in a coffee shop or sometimes you need to have the TV going on in the background in order to stay really focused. When the reticular activating system of the reticular formation system goes, becomes inactivated, we actually go to sleep. So that's just the opposite of being alert. If there is an injury to this part of the brain, we may actually go into a coma, meaning that we are in a permanent form of sleep. The second function of the reticular formation system relates to habituation. And what that word entails is the following. Your brain is receiving all kinds of sensory signals constantly and do we need to respond to every one of those sensations or sensory signals that arrives in our brain by no means no um, that's why this is the part of the brain the reticular activating system in particular has neurons that are specialized in ignoring very repetitive meaningless non-threatening stimuli while still remaining sensitive or responsive to others. Let's not forget that since the brainstem is part of the reticular um, formation system, we're clearly going to see that the various centers that we've mentioned in the medulla oblongata and even in the pons are going to be part of the reticular formation system. We mentioned respiratory centers in the medulla and in the pons, but also heart centers, better called the cardiac centers, um, and also a vasomotor center, which supervises the vasoconstricting or vasodilating of blood vessels. At the same time, we also see another type of motor control, which includes our both skeletal motor control and visceral motor control, 
are also um, a role or a f are functions of our reticular formation system. We see that this particular functional system helps maintain our muscle tone. Remember what that means, that's that ever so slightly contracted state that your skeletal muscles are in. And along with that, your balance and posture. If you didn't have muscle tone, it would be very difficult to maintain posture and therefore also balance. The visceral control centers that we find in the brainstem, remember, are your cardiac um, centers that regulate your heart rate. There's also a vasomotor center, which regulates whether blood vessels should vasoconstrict or vasodilate, depending on how the blood pressure needs to be adjusted. And then there are also respiratory centers, particularly in the medulla and the pons. And since the medulla and pons are part of the reticular formation system, clearly we need to list those here as well. The final function deals with pain modulation. And um, the reticular formation system function is, or, or I should say, is an area in the brain um, by which or through which pain signals can actually eventually reach the cerebral cortex. We also find that the descending analgesic pathways originate from this particular part of the brain. So the very last part that we need to look over now when it comes to the brain is the various ways in which the brain is protected. Now, the obvious methods of protection or the obvi obvious mechanisms of protection are your skull. Clearly your skull protects your brain, but also the skin as well as the hair on your scalp. So those are some obvious thing and things and I don't think we need to really discuss those any further. But in addition to that, we have four other important things to mention. We'll briefly mention the circle of Willis, but we will expand quite a bit on the other three, that is the meninges. And remember, meninges are these connective tissues surrounding the brain. We also will find them surrounding the spinal cord. And when they become inflamed, you've heard the term meningitis, or infected, I should say. The cerebrospinal fluid that we find in the subarachnoid space around the brain and in the ventricles also protects the brain. And then there's a so-called blood-brain barrier. Literally, most of our brain tissue is actually protected from um, most of the ingredients or most of the things that we find in our blood. And we'll see why that is important. So our brain is a very important organ in our body, along with the heart. Both the brain and the heart are two organs in our body that um, are going to be protected, sometimes at the expense of other organs, by the way. And you will learn in AMP2, and you see here um, for the brain, but in AMP2 for the heart, I should say, that these two important organs, the brain and the heart, have a vascular system that ensures that these two organs are always going to be able to be nourished with um, nutrient-rich blood and oxygen-rich blood. Even if perhaps there's some kind of damage in part of the circulation system in these two organs. Let's take a look at this. For instance, here we see the so-called circle of Willis, which kind of um, you can imagine that the um, pituitary gland sits right about here in the very center. So that gives you a bit of a feel for where it is, is located. Of course, this inset right here illustrates it to you as well. <coughs> there are two sets of important arteries that contrib contribute to the formation of the circle of Willis. There's more, as you can see. But the two vertebral arteries, which pass through the vertebral foramina of the, um, the cervical vertebrae. And then also the internal carotid arteries that we see right here um, also play a role in the formation of the so-called circle of Willis. So what's so important about the circle of Willis? Well, imagine that 
there is obstruction, let's say, right here. Perhaps a clot has formed. Notice that because we have the circular pattern in the brain, the blood can still reach all parts of the brain because it can either go this way and around. Well, it would go that way and around and still be able to make all, all the different structures. So it's easy to take a detour and still perfuse all the different tissues, tissue areas in the brain. And clearly I don't need this letter N over here. Sorry about that. So we see this in the heart as well, that there are, uh, there's a layout of blood vessels, arteries in particular, such that if there is obstruction in one area of the blood vessels, the arteries, the blood still has plenty of other areas to pass through to ensure the heart gets perfused. So that brings us to the meninges, and, and by the way, the singular fo form of meninges is menings. You may recall that the singular version of phalanges is phalanx, so kind of a similar uh, situation here. There are three layers of connective tissues around the brain. And the one that sits right on top of the sulci and the gyri, so this is actually right here where I'm uh, pointing now, this is the brain tissue. This would be the cerebral cortex, for instance. So directly on top of the cerebral cortex, we have our first layer called the pia mater. It's a very delicate layer, and I kind of wish it showed all the convolutions of the brain, but it doesn't. So you can, I'm going to ask you to try to remember that the brain has all those sulci and gyri. The next layer is called the arachnoid layer. And the reason why it's, it's called arachnoid is because it looks very spidery. In between these two layers, there's actually a space that we call the subarachnoid space. So in between here, between these two layers, the arachnoid space, that spidery layer and the pia mater, which literally means the delicate, peaceful uh, layer, there is a space called the subarachnoid space. And that's where we find cerebrospinal fluid. So this is cerebrospinal fluid that flows around the brain. We will also see that there is cerebrospinal fluid inside of the brain. Our final layer is called the dura mater, but the dura mater is actually a double layer. And we can't see that very well here. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to show it to you in the next slide. But you might, you do recall, I hope, that bone tissue, so this is our, a skull bone, is always going to have a layer of periosteum on both sides. So really it should be showing on both sides. Well, the periosteal layer on the inner side is actually one of the sublayers of the dura mater. And then there is the layer that follows the arachnoid layer of the dura mater. We'll look at the double layer, the dura mater, that is a double layer here on the next slide. But let's go over the functions of the meninges. Clearly, since they're connective tissues around the brain, they cover and protect the the central nervous system because they're also found around the spinal cord um, and that there's also quite a few blood vessels in there so they're protected as well we'll talk about what we mean by venous sinuses in just a moment the subarachnoid space is is going to be filled with csf so it's they provide another area for csf and also we'll see that the meninges create these partitions within the skull Again, a way to protect um, parts of the brain better. So this is a better slide to illustrate our three meninges. So once again, you see here the cerebral cortex, the gray matter. Deeper to it, we see the white matter. Here we see the longitudinal fissures. So this is one of our cerebral hemispheres. And here's another cerebral hemisphere. So this is a coronal cut and um, so that we can easily see that longitudinal fissure here. 
So directly covering the cerebral cortex, illustrated here in the yellow, is our pia mater, our delicate, peaceful layer. Then we see all of these spidery legs right here, which arise from this more reddish layer, we could say perhaps, that is our arachnoid layer. So the space filled with some of these spidery legs is our subarachnoid space. You see it's spelled out for you over here. Here's the arachnoid layer. And notice that the arachnoid layer has these little protrusions. And these little protrusions stick out into this sac-like vein, and a sac-like vein is called a sinus. Now, there are different sac-like or sinus, um, sinus areas around the brain. This one is called the superior sagittal sinus because of where it's located, but the different ones collectively are referred to as the, the dural sinuses. So they contain venous blood that is going to go back to the heart. And you'll see why that is in just a moment. So again, let's give these little protrusions that arise from the arachnoid mater a name. We call them arachnoid villi, or your book calls them arachnoid granulation villi. Um, just calling them arachnoid villi is uh, sufficient. And don't forget, this is subarachnoid space. So there seems to be some connection between the arachnoid villi, the subarachnoid space with the CSF, and the blood in the dural sinuses. But let's see how these dural sinuses are formed. And that brings us to the double-layered dura mater. The outer layer of the dura mater is literally the periosteum of our flat bone right about there. The inner layer follows our arachnoid layer and it is approximately here. And notice that it's in the gray. It follows the longitudinal fissure. Okay, so the inner layer of the dura mater follows into the longitudinal fissure but not the outer layer which is the periosteum. And therefore that creates this big space here in particular, there's smaller spaces here, but this big space here, which is a dural sinus, and in it we find venous blood, meaning oxygen-poor blood, that's going to go back to the heart. So how does this relate to these arachnoid villi and the subarachnoid space that has CSF in it? So we have CSF in this subarachnoid space. Well, as I'll show you in just a moment, cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, is actually formed from blood plasma. You know, most of the fluids in our body actually arise from our blood plasma. They're usually not all that different. There are some differences between the blood and the CSF, but nothing super, super major because the plasma is actually going to give rise to the cerebrospinal fluid. But cerebrospinal fluid is constantly circulating throughout or around our central nervous system and throughout our central nervous system. So it's constantly on the move and eventually it gets returned to the blood. And guess where that happens? right here. So the function of these arachnoid villi is to return the cerebrospinal fluid back to the blood and then the blood takes goes back to the heart. So as I pointed out the dura mater is a double layered meninx. It's actually quite tough. It's actually um, very leathery looking and feeling. The outer layer is the periosteum, so we can refer to it as the periosteal layer. The inner layer is referred to most often as the meningeal layer. And then recall that the, <clears throat> the, in the area in between 
tends to form the dural sinuses into which the arachnoid villi can then protrude. Now, the dura mater sometimes um, creates these partitions by major invaginations. For instance, you saw how the dura mater followed the longitudinal fissure. Well, that fold formed into the longitudinal fissure by the dura mater we call the falx cerebri. Falx literally means fold. So falx means fold. We also see a fold in between the two cerebellar hemispheres. So we have a phallic cerebelli. And then we have this tent-like structure that co covers the two cere cerebellar hemispheres. So, let's so the arachnoid mater is the middle menings and it has its name arachnoid because it looks very spidery. Don't forget that it's characterized by the arachnoid villi which protrude into the dural sinuses, for instance, the superior sagittal sinus, such that cerebrospinal fluid can be returned to the blood. And recall that when we return something to the blood, we use the term reabsorption. So unfortunately, this is the slide that should have come before the arachnoid mater, because this is where um, the different folds are illustrated. So let's go over them, even though I should have had this um, as an earlier slide. So right here, this is actually the dura mater that, that folds a part, creates a partition or a fold uh, in between the two cerebral hemispheres. So this is your phallic cerebri. And I don't see this being labeled on this slide, but you have the spelling on um, a, a couple of slides ago. We also have a um, tent-like structure called the, which we see right here, which is the phallic cerebellum. And we can't really illustrate very well, except maybe a little bit, the phallic uh, cerebellum or cerebella, which is what separates, which, which is the partition in between the two cerebellar hemispheres. The other thing that this particular diagram shows is where we find our sinuses. For instance, here is your superior sagittal sinus. Realize you're now looking at a sagittal cut so we can see the full length. And there's other sinuses. Here we see, for instance, the so-called inferior sagittal sinus, and there's more. I don't expect you to know the names of the specific uh, dural sinuses. You may just call them collectively the dural sinuses. So the deepest of the Mennings is called the Pia Mater. It's rather delicate, very vascularized, and it covers all the sulci and the gyruses of the brain. So that brings us to the cerebrospinal fluid. Remember I mentioned earlier that it arises from the blood plasma, but it does have some differences. Very often when our blood gives rise to some kind of a new fluid, the proteins or most of the proteins tend to stay behind. So we see that the cerebral, cerebrospinal fluid has much less protein in it compared to our blood. And the concentration of the ions is slightly different too. Supposedly there's also a whole lot more vitamin C present in the cerebrospinal fluid. The volume of our cerebrospinal fluid is pretty constant, somewhere between 125 to 150 milliliters, somewhere around there. And remember, it's constantly circulating uh, through the ventricles that are located in the brain and in the subarachnoid space around the brain. Plus, it also flows through the central canal of the spinal cord and in the subarachnoid space around the spinal cord. So the cerebrospinal fluid is a form of protection for the brain because it provides buoyancy to the brain. And what that literally means is that your brain can sort of bebop around in your skull and not crush under its own weight. Think, for instance, of 
um, a big, well, think of a whale, for instance. A whale, when it's submerged in the ocean water, it is capable of moving quite easily and it doesn't crush under its own weight, but the moment it beaches, um, it's, pretty, it's a pretty worthless organism because literally it, um, it crushes under its own weight. By having this fluid, this thin layer of fluid around our brain, we also are protected from um, hard knocks against our, our head. So let's say that we hit our head hard against the wall. We're probably not going to bruise our brain very easily because of that um, cerebrospinal fluid. Now, of course, it can only protect, uh, protect us up to a point, hit your head hard enough against, let's say, the windshield in a car accident, and clearly your brain will get bruised and will, uh, will have some injury to it. Finally, your cerebrospinal fluid is almost... Um, a form of a circulatory system uh, to, for the brain, meaning that it provides the brain with nourishment as well as um, a, a medium through which chemicals can flow, including neurotransmitters. So you learned earlier that there is cerebrospinal fluid present in the subarachnoid space in between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater. But deep within the brain, we also have cerebrospinal fluid located in these chambers that we call ventricles. These are chambers that are lined with ependymal cells on the inside. And for the most part, these ependymal cells are ciliated and keep the cerebrospinal fluid moving. Recall that the ventricles actually arise from the lumen of the neural tube in the embryo. And we have a total of four ventricles. So we have a total of four. We have two of the lateral ventricles. Then we have a third ventricle and a fourth ventricle. And we'll take a look at exactly where they're located. So we'll first take a look at a sagittal cut, meaning this right here on the left-hand side, or it's labeled a lateral view. And a lateral vent ventricle pretty much follows the shape of each cerebral hemisphere. So since this is a, a lateral view or sagittal cut, we only see one of the lateral ventricles. Um, well, you might see a little bit of the tail end of the second one, uh, over here. The third ventricle is located right here. It's always easy to recognize the third ventricle because it always is going to have a hole in it right there and that is the hole for the intermediate mass. And now I kind of covered up the hole but so this hole is for the intermediate mass of our thalamus. Finally, we have the fourth ventricle, which is located more in the brainstem area, so right and, and anterior to the cerebellum, so right about here. Now, the fourth ventricle is interconnected with the third ventricle with the help of a duct, and that is called the cerebral aqueduct. So let's now take a look at this anterior view. So now we can nicely see one lateral ventricle and a second lateral ventricle. The third ventricle goes right through the midst of the thalamus. Again, that's why we have um, that little opening in our third ventricle. Imagine the two hemispheres of the, thalama, the, the thalamus with um, in between them, the third ventricle. The third ventricle is interconnected to the fourth ventricle with the help of the cerebral aqueduct. Now, one more thing to mention, and that is that our lateral ventricles are interconnected with the third ventricle, 
via these foramina. So it's labeled over here. So we have two interventricular foramina, one for each lateral ventricle. And it's essentially this little connection here between the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle. A little hard to point out, but kind of over here, approximately here, and approximately there. Now, what we can also see in this illustration here is that the fourth ventricle has these little arms coming out. Actually, there's three of them, and we call them apertures. And they allow for the cerebrospinal fluid to flow into the subarachnoid space around the brain. The other thing to notice is that your fourth ventricle is continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. So the spinal cord has deep within it this long canal, which is a continuation of the fourth ventricle. It's often hard for students to visualize how the ventricles are positioned within the brain. So I've provided you with links to two animations and I can't play the animation very easily inside of my video here. Um, but I'll just point out again, here are your lateral ventricles. Here we see the third ventricle in the yellow. You can see the opening there for the intermediate mass of the thalamus, we have our fourth ventricle which with its apertures. And then we have in the red here, the cerebral, the cerebral um, aqueduct. And let's not forget that your fourth ventricle is continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. Can't, well, we actually even see very nicely, I'll circle them in red. We see the interventricular foramina right here as well, which interconnect the lateral ventricles with the third ventricle. So this is a lateral ventricle. This is a lateral ventricle. This is a third ventricle. This is the fourth ventricle. And this is yet another animation. It's important that you understand how the cerebrospinal fluid flows. And I gave you this chart, which I got out of Wikipedia, and honestly, I, I provided you with a little bit too much detail. Um, I'm not going to expect you to know all of these synonyms here. I mean, it'd be nice if you did, but it's, I think it's kind of overdoing it. So uh, try to just focus on the, um, the blue terminology. And so how do you interpret this chart? Well, it shows that the cerebrospinal fluid flows from the lateral vent ventricles to the third ventricle, and rather than titling this name, put via. So via the interventricular foramina, the CSF, the CSF makes it to the third ventricle. Then from the third ventricle, we make it to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct. And then from the fourth ventricle, the cerebral spinal fluid can go to the subarachnoid space via these apertures we talked about. And there's three apertures. Um, there's a median aperture and two lateral apertures. Don't worry too much about the cisterna magna and this other cisterna. So one more time, let's go over the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid. We have our lateral ventricles kind of following the shape of the corpus callosum. From there, our um, cerebrospinal fluid goes to the thalamus area and from there via the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle area. And then the fourth ventricle with the help of the apertures can send the cerebrospinal fluid around the brain in the subarachnoid space as well as into the central canal of the spinal cord. Let's not forget that there are all of these arachnoid villi that protrude into the dural sinuses from the arachnoid mater 
such that the cerebral spinal fluid can be reabsorbed back into the blood. Now these areas that I have circled are these little reddish capillary beds that are present in each one of the, the ventricles. And they're the ones that are responsible for the formation of the cerebrospinal fluid. These capillary beds we call choroid plexuses, singular choroid plexus. I guess you could also call them the choroid plexi. Now they work together with the ependymal cells that line the lumen of the ventricles to make the cerebrospinal fluid. The ependymal cells, don't forget, those are one of your supporting cells that we've learned about when we introduced you to the supporting cells of the central nervous system. And most of them are going to be looking like ciliated, simple columnar epithelial cells. There's also some microvilli areas um, in the ependymal cells, or I should say there are microvilli present on some of the ependymal cells to help with reabsorbing as much cerebrospinal fluid as possible. The cilia, on the other hand, move the cerebrospinal fluid around. We find in the ependymal cells various ion pumps, which then can um, control what kinds of ions are going to be pumped into the cerebrospinal fluid. And we find that they help cleanse the cerebrospinal fl fluid by removing wastes. So there is a choroid plexus that hangs off the roof of each ventricle. The only place where we do not find them is in the cerebral aqueduct, so only in the roofs of the ventricles. So for instance, here we're looking at the corpus callosum with the fornix just underneath it. And here we have the two hemispheres of the thalamus. And remember, right through the middle or in between the two hemispheres of the thalamus should be the third ventricle. So this is our third ventricle, while this right here is our, one of our lateral ventricles and another lateral ventricle. So in the red, then, we see the capillary bed that, that is present in our two lateral ventricles as well as in our third ventricle. So they're interconnected in this area. So in this coronal cut of the brain, we see here our longitudinal fissure. So this is our cerebral hemisphere, another cerebral hemisphere. You can just barely see the cerebral cortex here. So these two cavities that you see clearly here are your um, two lateral ventricles. And if you look really carefully, you see like little squigglies inside. And those are your little capillary beds, better called the choroid plexuses. So clearly, there are plenty of capillaries in the brain such as the choroid plexuses that we just looked at, that together with the ependymal cells help form the cerebrospinal fluid. But the majority of the capillaries of the brain are relatively impermeable. I'm not saying that they're not, that they are impermeable, but not that many things can easily pass through these capillaries. In many parts of the body, capillaries are pretty leaky and molecules and ions can pass through the capillary wall. Remember that a capillary is made up of simple squamous epithelial tissue often referred to as endothelium, right? Um, so the endothelium in most capillaries is pretty leaky, meaning that things can pass through the cells but many things can pass in between the cells. So let me sketch this real quick. So if we have, let's say here, a couple of simple squamous cells, maybe I'll just draw three. So with their flattened nuclei, and let's say this is where the lumen of the blood is, then in most capillaries we see that 
um, particles, molecules, ions can pass, of course, through the cells, especially if the particles are hydrophilic or lipid soluble, but also in between the cells. So these there's a, there's enough space in between the cells, the endothelial cells, where that things can pass through. But in many capillaries in the brain, we do not see this leakiness in between the cells. As a matter of fact, we're going to see what we call tight junctions. And it makes it very difficult for molecules and ions to pass in between the cells. So that doesn't happen in the case of the brain. And therefore, most things are forced to pass through the actual endothelial cells. Now, why is it so important for our brain to be protected from most of the components in our blood? Well, that is to ensure that the brain's environment remains relatively stable. There are a lot of solute fluctuations in our blood, and it would literally create havoc in our brain with excitation and inhibition constantly and crazily and, and in a very random fashion. And that's not a good situation. So what we find is that only um, things that can pass through the cells are going to make it into the brain tissue for the most parts of the brain. There are some areas in the brain where the capillaries are leaky. For instance, the choroid plexuses. The hypothalamus is another area where capillaries are relatively leaky because the hypothalamus needs to be able to check or taste the blood and make sure that you're not thirsty, make sure you're not hungry, make sure that um, the, the hypothalamus needs to be able to detect, detect certain levels of hormones so that the body can respond appropriately, etc., etc. So, what are some things that can make it through the blood-brain barrier? Well, clearly water and oxygen and carbon dioxide and, of course, lipid-soluble molecules are going to be able to make it through by means of passive diffusion. Remember, the, the cell membrane is a phospholipid bi bilayer, so anything that's made up of a lipid type, a steroid like vitamins or hormones, uh, or um, not all hormones, but some hormones, um, are, or, or phospholipids or triglycerides, they are going to be able to make it by... Um, make it through the, the blood-brain barrier by means of passive diffusion. Also, the crucial nutrients. Remember, your neurons are very dependent on aerobic respiration. They need to be able to make a lot of ATP. So glucose and amino acids are going to get through pretty well. But then, like I said, many other substances in the blood, pathogens, bacterial tox toxins, and all kinds of stuff we eat that really has no business making it to the brain cells to not start firing things in the brain, um, they are not easily going to make it through. By the way, the little astrocytes play a role in, in ensuring that tight junctions are formed in the endothelial layer of the capillaries. So here we're looking at a picture, and at first it might seem a little bit confusing, so let me help you out. Near the bottom here, notice it says a pia mater artery that then becomes a smaller and smaller arteriole, and that keeps branching and that eventually becomes a capillary. So really, we should be focusing here on the capillary where we have our simple squamous epithelial tissue. So that's our endothelium here. And here we have the little bulbous endings of the astrocytes, which help form tight junctions in between our endothelial cells. And they didn't really make this very clear that these are tight junctions, but you need to make... Um, that assumption that things cannot pass through these tight junctions here. So they cannot, we cannot see that happening there. Um, and of course, in your bigger blood vessels, we're going to have, in addition to our endothelial layer, some smooth muscle tissue, such that those little blood vessels can actually go through vasoconstriction and vasodilation. The blood-brain barrier is not perfect, however. 
Remember that anything that is lipid soluble is going to be able to get through. Another way of referring to those kinds of things is that they are lipophilic. Anything that is a lipid can pass through the phospholipid bilayer of the endothelial cells. And that includes things such as alcohol and nicotine, anesthetics, many of the street drugs are be able to, going to be able to just diffuse through. There are also some neurotoxins that can get through the blood-brain barrier with the help of active transport. And then, as I mentioned, some things in the brain should not have a blood-brain barrier. Your hypothalamus needs to constantly be able to taste the blood. So does the vomiting center in the medulla. And then finally, the pineal gland is another good example of an area where we do not see a blood-brain barrier. And let's not forget the choroid plexuses. Interestingly enough, stress can actually make the blood-brain barrier less effective to the point that more things will be able to pass through. And then just to show you that the blood-brain barrier is very important to us, it is already present at birth. This then wraps up the brain. Thanks for watching.